Welcome to episode two of Detroit Black Millionaire Numbers Men. I'm Rita Dickerson of Rita Dickerson Detroit Black History. In episode one, we discuss John Roxborough, Everett Watson, Walter Norwood, Willie D. Mosley, Thomas Hammond, Irvin Rohn. John White will be discussed in episode three. We also discuss the neighborhoods of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. If there is any copyrighted material in this video, it is allowable under the 1976 Copyright Act regarding educational purposes and or discussion. Some of the topics we'll be discussing in episode two are what is a race man or a race woman, a phrase that was commonly used back in the day. We'll also have a section about Joe Lewis's career beginning and his championship with the help of numbers men. We'll also discuss a murder suicide that exposed city government and Detroit police corruption in relationship to policy and the numbers. We'll also discuss the over 100 criminal indictments that resulted from the scandal. Share this video with friends and relatives. Press the subscription button below and the notification bell so you can be notified of any upcoming videos. So let's get started. The definition for a race man or a race woman was a person who is dedicated to the welfare and betterment of black people through supporting black economic growth, neighborhood stability, and political endeavors. They supported organizations like the NAACP and the Detroit Urban League. The Urban League sponsored a camp called the Green Pastures, which was located in Grass Lake, Michigan, which was where the 400-acre property of Everett Watson was located. And from 1931 to 1961, over 15,000 youth attended the camp. Many of them were sports enthusiasts. They supported uh, athletes like Eddie Tolan, who was an Olympian. And today the city of Detroit honors him by having the Eddie Tolan Field at the corner of Mack and I-75 Service Drive. They supported boxers like William Holman. And college football stars like Willis Ward who would go on to become a lawyer and a Wayne County probate judge, and track star Eugene Beattie. None of these athletes would have gotten as far as they did without the help from these numbers men. Roxborough once said, I promise myself I'll help myself first, then I'll help my black brothers. He, Watson, and other businessmen founded the Great Lakes Mutual Insurance Company in 1928. For the most part, blacks were locked out of the white insurance company business. And Great Lakes became one of the largest employers of African Americans in Michigan. One of their first headquarters was located in Paradise Valley on Beacon and St. Antoine, and later at 1301 East Warren. And very ironically, that is the same address and the same location of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History today. Their last headquarters building was located on Woodward and Euclid, and it was built there from the ground in the 1960s. The building still stands today. I recall going to the House of Beauty, which was located just to the left of the front door, and later going to my dentist's office on the second floor. I remember the pride that I felt going in and seeing a black-owned, black-built from the ground-up building. At the time, it was a source of great pride for the black community. Just a few steps south of this building, on the other side of the gas station, was located the infamous Algiers Motel, 
the scene of the execution of three black unarmed teenagers during the 1967 uprising by Detroit police officers. In 2017, during the 50th year commemoration of the 67 uprising, I painted this painting, which links the death of the three teenagers in 67 to unarmed individuals who are still being killed today. Back to the 1930s, Roxborough and Watson and several other businessmen invested in this apartment building and it still stands today. People like uh, Jessie Slayton, the first black woman common pleas judge, and Howard Sims of Sims Varner architectural firm, which designed the current Charles Wright Museum. Roxborough and Joe Lewis, the champion, would also stay in this building. The apartment building is on Kirby and Bobian and at the opposite end of the block on Kirby and Brush, right behind the parking structure of the College for Creative Studies, Roxborough would buy this house, a two-family flat, seen on the left with the two yellow stripes. It's located today across the street from what is now known as Peck Park and just east of the college parking structure. John Roxborough would send at least 30 people to the University of Michigan. He would help people with rent, food, and coal. He would buy playground equipment and hire college graduates and others. And he would help set up ambitious employees in business. Roxborough would meet Joe Louis Barrow when he was 17 years old in 1931, when he was practicing boxing at what became known as Brewster Center, seen here. His parents were living at the time in Black Bottom. Just four years later, the Brewster projects would be built up around this center. And of course, they're famous for the home of the Supremes, seen walking in Brewster projects. Florence Ballard on the left, Diana Ross and Mary Wilson. This is a view of the gym where Joe Lewis would train in Brewster Center located in Paradise Valley and where he would meet Roxborough. Lewis would become Golden Gold's champion at age 20. Roxborough had been a championship basketball player in his youth. He was an instructor at Brewster Center when he met Lewis. Prior to his becoming a numbers man, he had been a post office clerk, a Wayne County City Clerk Office employee, and he had been a Bell's Bondsman, where he had come in contact with a lot of black policy men. And it was at that time that he decided that that was a good way for him to make his fortune. The numbers game came to black Detroit in the mid to late 1920s after it had been invented around 1920 in Harlem by Casper Holstein, who was a black Virgin Island immigrant. He introduced the system of deriving a winning number from three horse races, rather than in policy where the winning number is pulled from a drum containing several numbers. Sometime after 1931, Roxborough became Lewis's manager and developed a father-son relationship with him. And at one point, he even moved in with Roxborough and his wife. He mentored Lewis and taught him how to dress and how to present himself to the media and to the public. Roxborough crafted a very wholesome boy next door image for Lewis. Here you see him with his mother and his wife, Marva. He was instructed to never be seen with nor standing by a white woman. During a time of very anti-black sentiment in the country. The Michigan State Boxing Commission advised Roxborough to get a white co-manager for Lewis. They preferred to negotiate and deal with a white man rather than with Roxborough. He refused. 
Instead, he chose Julian Black of Chicago as co-manager. He took Lewis there in 1935 to train and start his professional career. Julian Black was a very wealthy African-American lawyer, boxing manager, and also a numbers man. Together, they chose Jack Blackburn to be Lewis's trainer, who was a former lightweight and welterweight boxer himself. Here you see the four of them together in Chicago. After much training and several fights, they were ready for the big time, New York City. But they received the same response. The New York State Boxing Commission wanted to only deal with a white manager. They were forced to hire this man, Mike Jacobs, boxing promoter. So what this meant was Lewis was not only paying Roxborough 25% and Julian Black 25%, he now had to pay Mike Jacobs part of his earnings. And Mike Jacobs called all the shots. Lewis's 1936 fight with Max Schmeling was his first fight of consequence in New York. And it was a chance for the winner to go on to have a chance at the championship. Unfortunately, Lewis lost this fight and it was one of his first professional losses. He was knocked out in the 12th round. No black man had been given the chance at the championship crown since Jack Johnson's reign. He openly flaunted his relationships with white women and married several of them. In 1910, an Illinois congressman named Thomas Mann helped to enact the Mann Act, which made it illegal to transport women and girls for immoral purposes. Historians generally believe that this act was passed specifically to criminalize Johnson for his behavior. He was arrested in 1913, found guilty, and sentenced to one year in prison. James Braddock was champion in 1937. He became champion by defeating Max Baer, who was the father of Max Baer Jr., who played Jethro on the TV show The Beverly Hillbillies. To encourage Braddock to fight Lewis for the title, Mike Jacobs brokered, brokered a deal that would guarantee Braddock 10% of all of Lewis's future earnings whenever he defended his title, should he win. The fight was held June 22nd in Chicago at Kaminsky Park in front of 41,000 people. Lewis won the fight and ended up defending his title 25 times. Russell Crowe, the Australian actor, would portray Braddock in the movie The Cinderella Man. The stage was now set for a rematch with Max Schmeling. The fight was held in 1938 in Yankee Stadium in front of 90,000 people on June 22nd. Here are some pre-fight publicity shots of the two men. Here you see a shot of the stadium. Joe Lewis would knock out Max Schmeling in two minutes and four seconds of the very first round. Roxborough had instructed Lewis that whenever you beat a white opponent, never smile, never celebrate. And he went quietly to his corner. Here you see Julian Black and John Roxborough to our right as the announcer holds up Lewis's hand in victory. Here's a newspaper headline from the following day. While John Roxborough was busy with Joe Lewis in the mid and late 30s, there was a, back in Detroit, there was a serious challenge to black ownership and control of numbers and policy. This challenge was greatly influenced by the end of prohibition in 1933. Prohibition was a constitutional ban on the production, importation, 
transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. Now, Michigan started its prohibition two years earlier, and during that time, Canada and Toledo were sources of illegal alcohol brought into Michigan. During that time, groups like the Jewish Purple Gang dealt in bootlegging and other vices like murder, extortion, and kidnapping. It was led by the Bernstein brothers who attended this school, Bishop School in the Eastern Market. The Italians were also involved in bootlegging, allegedly led by Peter Licavoli who was charged with other illegal activities such as prostitution and murder for hire. Now with the end of Prohibition in 1933, these other groups looked for another source of income and they started encroaching on the black numbers business, which was extremely lucrative. They were making millions a year. In the midst of all this, an enormous corruption scandal was unveiled. Janet McDonald, who worked at the Great Lakes Numbers House, killed herself and her daughter. She had been working there with her boyfriend, William McBride, and he had recently ended things between the two of them. She left handwritten letters and had them delivered to the police commissioner, all Detroit newspaper editors, the Michigan governor, and the FBI for Detroit. She accused law enforcement officials of taking bribes from her ex-boyfriend McBride and other numbers organizations. Wayne County Prosecutor Duncan McRae refused to investigate and Detroit's Common Council summoned a one-man grand jury. McDonald's ex-boyfriend McBride suspiciously died three months later in Florida of pneumonia. Chester O'Hara on the left was named Special Prosecutor and Homer Ferguson was named judge in a one-man grand jury. When the indictments came down in April of 1940, over 130 people were indicted, including the man who was mayor in 1939, Richard Redding. He was voted out of office when the scandal broke. You see him here being fingerprinted. Also indicted was Fred Fromm, the superintendent of police, who you see on the right hiding his face. Police Inspector Raymond Bocher, Lieutenant John McCarthy, who was chief of the racket squad. Dozens of Detroit police officers were also indicted, including eight black ones who are seen here being fingerprinted. Wayne County Prosecutor Duncan McRae, who had initially refused to investigate, was indicted along with his chief investigator, Harry Colburn, and Wayne County Sheriff Thomas Wilcox. Also indicted were Everett Watson, John Roxborough, Thomas Hammond, Irvin Roan, and Walter Norwood, who owned the Norwood Hotel. Altogether, over 130 indictments were issued. Let's just look at this list. Mayor Redding in the Detroit Police Department, the superintendent, police inspector, police lieutenant, 88 police officers. In Wayne County Division, the county prosecutor, the county's chief investigator, and the Wayne County Sheriff, in addition to Roxborough, Watson, Hammond, and Roan, and Norwood, 38 other numbers, operators, and employees were indicted. These indictments came down in 1940, and this signals the end of part two. In part three, we'll discuss the trial, the verdicts, and the sentencing of key people. We'll also discuss the 1943 Detroit race riot, the changing neighborhoods, and of course we'll continue with the black numbers business. And we'll have a section on numbers man John White and the Gotham Hotel. And we'll end with how the Paradise Valley and Black Bottom areas look today.
Don't forget to press the subscribe button down below and the notification bell so you can be notified of upcoming videos. Share the video with family and friends and see you next time for the conclusion of Seven Black Millionaire Numbers Men and the Era They Lived In.